Three, two, one, action! Personal trainer. Packs a real punch thanks to his... Sarah. Sales assistant. Seals the deal every date night with gastro sea salt. So this is the Young's Fish Food commercial, and it's basically a comedy script. It's taking the absurdity of like, someone in a domestic situation, you know, like an everyday person, and putting them into some extreme natural phenomena. So it's this kind of grandeur of this massive wave coming up and, and washing over this person in, in, in kind of everyday clothes. I'd like to start by thanking Trevor Robinson, the director, Alex Aziz, the producer, Quiet Storm, the production company, and Young's Fish, the client. Because without their support, none of this would be possible. That it's rare to get access to a film set like this. Um, this is a big commercial, big, you know, big client, Young's Fish, you know, very established production company, Quiet Storm. It's very rare to get that kind of access. Uh, Trevor Robinson, the director, is a bit of a legend. Uh, he's been in the industry from, you know, the early 90s. He set up Quiet Storm. At the time when he set Quiet Storm up, it was the first production company stroke agency to exist. I mean, it's something that now people are starting to kind of realise, uh, cotton, cotton onto. But back then, it was completely unique. He was a total trailblazer. Um, and he's known for his philanthropy and I think in a way that's why he allowed us in because he's always you know he's done a lot of work himself in supporting kind of young uh, you know minorities getting into the film industry. So we have a, a whole rig behind this green screen that's going to produce a, a real wave and then we have our artist that's going to be standing on some rocks there and a the wave washes up behind them, rises up, crests and then falls. And we want to catch that with a motion control move going in from a, a total shot to like a close-up. So that's kind of the shot we're producing here on this stage. Next door, we've got some sets built for the serving scene. And in the last day, we reduced the whole crew down to just the food shots. So it's, got, it's like three-tier operation. The big effect shot, domestic interior set builds, and then the precision food shots. At the moment we're in the pre-light stage, so what we're doing is we're prepping, we've got some riggers rigging up, on the, up in the, the gantry, and we're hanging green screens, putting lights up here. There's certain situations you can't avoid pre-lighting. If you're doing a big rig, a big set, as this is, this is a big set with a big rig, and you can see there's a lot of lights going up into the ceiling here. Now, this is a day's work, basically. If you had a full crew in here doing this, you would probably either have to bring the crew in incredibly early in the morning, and you get into time off the clock and all kinds of problems with in, in paying the crew. Or you have a full crew waiting around for this to be finished. So it's just a cost exercise. So what you want to try and do is limit the amount of people on set doing nothing. It's for me to talk producers into ways of saving money in terms of how the lighting is going to be conducted. So if I can see something that's going to benefit from a pre-light, then I'm always going to suggest a pre-light. I'm always going to want to buy myself more time to get something right. And also to have time to make a mistake and to react to it. I still have time to order some more lights in if I need more lights, you know, or I can change something if I need to change it. Just you bought some time for that, which on the bigger rigs is actually quite important. So the kind of the idea of this is, is we're basically creating like a really dramatic, cinematic environment and putting a normal person in that environment and the comedy works in the absurdity of that situation. What we're basically doing here is we're building a 3D background. We're basically combining that, compositing that with real foreground elements. And those real foreground elements are the, the water effect, the, the actual wave is real, uh, and also the rocks. And what we're going to do is we're going to combine those two worlds, right, to make a, a seamless effect. So what I need to think about is how to match the lighting of the foreground to match what's going to be used eventually as a CG background, right? So what I need is a reference of the CG background. And I look and I study that reference and I go, well, how does that reference work? Where's the light coming from? What's the quality of the light? What colours are involved in the light? And you'll see that there's a sky and it's got lots of different colours going on. Uh, and to really match that properly, we needed colour control lights. So traditionally how we would lit this is we'd use either tungsten lights or HMI lights. But because nowadays you have the, the option of RGB WW lights, so you can dial any colour in, I thought, well, let, let's put those onto a desk. I was looking at the colours of the sky and looking at the horizon line. I was looking at all of these things to sort of get a sense of what the kind of quality of light would be. And then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to replicate that in the studio. So I already have a point of view. I kind of know that I need the lights to be, um, to graduate from overhead to the horizon. The big advantage of LED lights is you can put them up there and you, have, you put them all into a desk uh, and then you can just control the colours from the floor really quickly. And that's, that is 
massive. So this changes the colours on there. And what we're trying to do is match this. So we, we can divide this up into banks, can't we? A usually a good start with a sky in a big studio is like some kind of frame that you put a diffusion material over. Because you, what you want is you want a very soft, homogenised light coming from above uh, that can be controlled. It's probably, this colour's probably more important than that colour. Because okay. when you think about it, that colour doesn't even... That's just in the background, that yeah. colour. Have you seen this, Charlie? This swatch we got, Show Tool Swatch. So basically we go into Lee Gels, uh, designer edition, and we got all of our colours here. We'll start with a medium blue, 116. This is a mid blue green, medium blue green. So yeah, so as I say, you start thinking about this process, you start analysing the references you've got, and you start kind of imagining what the end result should be, and then you backwards engineer it from the end result, what that should be, with the elements you know are going to be set elements and you kind of fill in the gaps in your imagination first and then when you when you have a plan you start communicating that plan as that starts building momentum and starts becoming a reality certain problems will come along and then your job is to basically put you know deal with the problems as they emerge okay so hang on so what was that one called that's medium blue okay show me that off and then back on And then back off. Well, it's still gonna, not going to be high enough, I don't think. It's not going to be high enough. Yeah, maybe we just go for a top light with this. If you go right up. Yeah, okay, all right, show us that then, yeah. Show us that off and on, Josh. And on. Yeah, okay, I think that's quite good. This process is always about kind of uh, having your initial idea, and then as the process goes, you're always recalibrating the situation, right? So you get, there's a process of recalibration going on constantly. If things change, you're going to be a little bit fluid with it, you know? It's like a dance, basically. Without doubt, the, the most important person to have by your side on the film set is your gaffer. The most intimidating thing about big film sets is, is, is usually the lighting. You know, the, the camera side of things actually is quite quick to learn and normally with directors they'll have a point of view about that anyway. So it will be a negotiation with you and a director as to what lens you use and how you move the camera. But when it comes to the lighting that's kind of left up to you to a great extent. And unless you have an experienced gaffer with you that can hold your hand and guide you through the process, then you are going to come unstuck. There's no harm in putting the track right up to there, is there? No, I think we should and then go back as far as we can. Just, I'll show you the move basically. So this is the 21 mil. So it's probably from this sort of distance all the way into, into there. You know, it's gonna go up to just, so that's probably about that distance. Maybe there, maybe there. Yeah. Part of the role of a director of photography is you're helping the director with the visual aspects of the storytelling. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to make things as photographically appropriate for the idea as possible. But with that, you're also trying to make things feel cinematic. Certainly for me, I'd like things to try and be as cinematic as possible. A director of photography basically is someone who takes the written word and transcribes it to visual storytelling. You could say that a cinematographer is a visual psychiatrist. It's like someone who understands how to manipulate an audience by virtue of visual imagery. Ready, and three, two, one, action! And look to camera. <laughs> uh, cut. The integration's great. I mean, it's definitely a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. If I was worried at first, the, the wave would fall behind him and it could just easily be done in post. Oh, know? right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's like oh, lunging, it, yeah, it lunges over, forward, yeah. it comes over him. You yeah. could see it hit his helmet and everything. Yeah, 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 it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The comedy works. Trevor's always been hilarious to work with. He's such a great character. Um, uh, he's, he's, he has fun on set, you know. He, he's very, he's a very, He's a funny guy and he makes everyone laugh and he relaxes everyone and I mean Trevor's great at comedy and it's you know that that's a real skill, you know. It's, you're born with funny bones or not. Ready and three, two, one, action! Three, two, one, action!
the theory was that the wave wells up and then as it falls back down again, the water forms and pools and has a slight rippling effect. So we mimic that by basically having these little mirror trays down there with water in. So you'll see when it's all put together that there's an arts, kind of an after effect of rippling water on the face, which I think will work, probably work quite well in close up. And then once we got our artist in there, we realised that the light was a little bit flat on the artist. I'm always trying to find a way of creating as much shape in the set as possible. As cinematographers, our primary role is to take a two-dimensional situation and make it feel as immersive and three-dimensional as possible. So the problem with this shot, obviously, is we're starting quite wide and we're ending quite close. So what we have to do is we have to make a, a realistic representation of the light for the wide shot, so the wide shot feels naturalistic. But then also when you ca it carries you into the close-up, the close-up should look like it has enough shape and interest on the face and the artists look um, cosmetically good, you know. I put that, that boom light uh, over the top first, thinking that that was going to be our key light. But then when I saw it, I realised that actually what's probably going to happen in reality is that shaft of sunlight is going to come down and hit the ground and it's going to bounce off the ground and key the artist or maybe bounce off a rock. Uh, and so the artist, in effect, would be backlit by the sun here that, that sun would hit some rocks here and then that will give a soft glow back and that will be your key light, the soft glow back. So we mimic, we mimic that with an additional light and that's when it started coming together for me. That's what I love about lighting. It's like I think of something in my head first and then I see it happen. And that's the satisfaction. It's like being an architect. You have an idea for a house, you think about it for a while, you draw a picture of it, and then when the builders finally turn up, you see it coming together. That's hugely exciting. So usually with a time of day, you're talking about the sun and the sky. If you're doing exterior, for example, or even an interior during daytime, it's going to be governed by what quality of light's coming through the windows, right? So you're thinking about the sky and you're thinking about the sun and what quality are they going to have. Now, when you have a reference like the reference I had, it's a very biblical sky you know, with, a, with, a, with a, a break in the clouds and a shaft of light coming through, you know, like you're the chosen one, you know. You know, it's quite dramatic. And so that was our reference to begin with. So I'm like, how do I recreate that? What lights do I need to recreate that? You know, how do I get the green screen to work uh, and separate the, the water, but not overlight the thing? Because if you overlight the thing, it starts looking a little bit cartoon-like and it doesn't look real, right? So it's, there's all little kind of things to consider. Light is a fascinating, mysterious energy and, and you know sometimes what you think is going to work doesn't work and that's, that's why I'm still doing it 25 years later because it's still to me so fascinating. I, I make mistakes uh, now but they're a lot smaller than I did 25 years ago. If you want to know more about lighting, go to my Instagram. Uh, we do a series called Set Notes where we break down all the lighting on a film set.